Hey guys, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. In today's edition of What I Eat in a Day YouTube Reviews, I'm going to be taking a look at Healthy Emmy. Now, this one has been highly requested for months on end. And after taking a wee peek at Emmy's Instagram and YouTube, I knew I better get on it stat. Now, Emmy is a YouTuber and vegan nutritionist who advocates for a high carb plant-based diet. She's also the creator of the Slim on Starch program, which is an eight week weight loss program that allegedly helps clients gain food freedom and lose weight while on a high carb plant-based diet without ever counting calories or restricting portion sizes. Seems like a bit of a dichotomy and interesting selection of words, but we'll get way more into that soon. Now, Emmy doesn't really do traditional What I Eat In A Day videos that I would normally review on my channel, but she does have several vegan weight loss recipes and suggested full day meal plans, which is what we're gonna be taking a closer look at today. Later on, we're gonna be looking at Emmy's general overview on her diet, as well as some of the health claims behind eating a high carb, plant-based vegan diet. So definitely stay tuned for that. Now, before we jump into my review, I wanna start with my general disclaimer that the information in this video is for entertainment and educational purposes only, and you should always seek out the help of a registered dietitian or medical professional for your unique case. Also, this video in particular may be a bit triggering for some people who are currently or who have previously struggled with disordered eating or an eating disorder. So feel free to skip this video if you're unsure. Now, without further ado, let's meet Emmy. Now, I am going to be showing you meals, but here's something that you have to know about this meal plan. There are no portion sizes. There is no calorie counting. There is no restriction. If you have a plate of what I show you and you're still hungry, have another one. So shout out to all the haters and goodbye to all the haters that say there's no calories. Have as much as you want, honeys. Eat as much as you want fuel up and eat this food and feel good and satiated and full so that you can just move on with your life, lose the weight and feel incredible. All right, so that was a short and sweet little intro to Emmy where she introduces herself and welcomes all of us honeys into her eat as much as you want plant-based lifestyle program. Now, she also encourages her viewers to eat to feel fueled and satisfied, even if that means having an extra portion of food. Now, I like the no calorie counting thing, but I am still skeptical about what this actual meal plan involves. So, of course, I took a closer look. Now, Emmy's Slim on Starch website has tons and tons of positive testimonials of people who have lost anywhere between a few pounds to up to 70 pounds. While the testimonials do sound convincing in terms of the amount of weight that clients have been able to lose, I do wanna flag that this is only an eight week program. So we really don't know anything about the sustainability of this program in the long run, or if and how clients have been able to maintain the weight loss. And judging by the fact that the vast majority of people who go on restrictive diets for weight loss end up gaining the weight back, also known as weight cycling, I'm definitely skeptical of this anecdotal evidence. But let's take a look at the recipes and meal plans to see how they fit within this food freedom philosophy that she preaches. Let's start with breakfast. carrot cake oatmeal whatever it is that you want to call it it is delicious okay so emmy's first breakfast is this carrot cake or pumpkin pie oatmeal and as you probably know by now i am all for a healthy bowl of oats in the morning and this one has oats apple carrots pumpkin and pumpkin pie spice super yum and i love the complex carbs and fiber from the oats and the pumpkin and the carrots and the apple but for a breakfast, this is pretty low in fat, protein, and also calories. It's just over like 200 calories per bowl. But by adding in some hemp hearts or nuts, or even some nut butter, it would have made this a much more complete breakfast meal to start the day. 
Again, I get that she said you can have a second portion if you're hungry, but it really wouldn't fix the fact that this is just straight up carbs. Let's take a look at day two. So in the bulk buy section, the oats are 149 a pound. So a cup of dry oats came out to be 38 cents and that is 300 calories. And then with that, I had a banana, which came out to be 24 cents at 105 calories. So mm, okay, so we have another oats recipe here. And in this clip, she's talking about buying oats in bulk to save money, which is an awesome tip. But budgeting aside, this meal is also very carb heavy, especially since one cup of dry oats would yield about two cups cooked. Now, I can't speak for everyone, but I would have a really hard time dragging myself through that volume of oats if there wasn't some nuts or seeds or maple syrup or cinnamon to help me through. Even like a little pinch of salt would really help bring out the flavor. And that is imperative in my books when it comes to making oats. Anyway, flavor aside, we are also getting about 82 grams of carbohydrate from this one meal, which translates to 41% of the daily carbohydrate recommendations for women and about 30% for men. Yes, this bowl has more protein than the last one we just saw, about 11 grams, but that's still not a lot considering there's 450 calories in it. Let's take a look at breakfast number three. Oh boy, okay. Um, so I'm glad to see we're getting a boost of flavor with some cocoa powder and cinnamon. Even though the amount of cocoa and cinnamon is kind of like making my mouth dry just to think about it, so yeah. But again, this recipe is just straight up carbs. I mean, it's low in protein, fat, and calories. It's just like over 200 calories and less than four grams of protein. She could have definitely made this more complete with some nut butter on top or used my hack and pureed in some soft tofu. So if you didn't see that, then definitely check it out right here. But it's now obvious to me and also not surprising when we remember the name of the program is Slim on Starch, that Emmy is part of the high carb, low fat plant-based movement. I'll go more into detail on that in a bit, but let's just discuss the effects of having a strictly high carb breakfast. Now there is some research to suggest that enjoying a high fiber carbohydrate rich breakfast may assist with weight management efforts by maintaining satiety. That makes a lot of sense because fiber is slow digesting and is really inherently satiating. Having said that, one 2016 study found that strictly high carb breakfasts were associated with lower metabolic rates and increased hunger compared to higher protein breakfasts. This increased hunger was likely associated and attributed to the kind of up and down in blood glucose levels after a really high carb breakfast. So while the fiber from the oats and the sweet potato bowl can definitely contribute to satiety, without a source of adequate protein or fat to really help mediate those blood sugar levels, you'll likely feel pretty hungry after eating. These breakfasts in general, with the exception of day two, are also generally pretty low calorie. There's really no protein and no fat. So you're going to definitely need to go for round two. And thank goodness Emmy's plan says it's okay for us to have a second or third portion if you're hungry. But man, I don't think I could do another whole big bowl of oats or sweet potatoes, even if I was really hungry. Even with multiple servings, you might feel physically satiated, but not emotionally satisfied at all. And that is really, really important. Emmy also mentions in her video that bananas are best digested when they're ripe. So I want to talk a little bit more about that right now. So a banana's ripeness will ultimately impact the rate at which it affects blood sugar levels. So for instance, bananas that are less ripe have more resistant starch and as a result have a lower glycemic index, meaning they don't create as much of an increase in blood sugar levels and can help keep you fuller longer. The resistant starch in less ripe bananas or green bananas 
also functions like soluble fiber by helping to relieve constipation and feeding the good bacteria in your gut. As a banana ripens, the resistant starch starts to decrease and is converted into sugar. So while ripe bananas may have less soluble fiber so that they move through the system faster, there are actually a lot of digestive benefits to eating unripe bananas if you can. Personally, I don't like green bananas, so I will get my resistant starch sources elsewhere, but I just wanted to clear up that myth that they're inherently bad for digestion when arguably the opposite may be true. Let's see what Emmy has in store for lunch. Okay, so I'm glad we're getting some more substantial protein in this meal from the huge amount of nutritional yeast, which provides about 31 grams of protein for this meal. And combined with these small amounts of protein in the mushrooms and potato, this meal provides a solid 46 grams of protein in total. So I can't say I'm mad about that after what we just saw at breakfast. This meal also provides about 440 calories and a little more fat than breakfast. So basically like six grams. Still lots of room to boost that up, but not surprisingly, she doesn't cook with oil, which I talked about in this video here. And there's also no overt sources of whole food fats either, which really isn't ideal. But let's take a look at the rest of Emmy's recipes before making any other conclusions. So one cup of dry rice, and then I got a can of beans. A can of beans is 79 cents. All right, and then from the frozen section, I got a pound of broccoli. Lunch, we racked up 876 calories for only $2.28. Okay, so this is Emmy's budget-friendly day. Um, kind of a boring meal, yes, especially because there is no seasoning on any of it, but the combination of rice, beans, and broccoli can definitely provide a really balanced and nutrient-dense meal. Having said that, I am a bit concerned about the portion sizes and the fact that the ratios in my books are totally off. I can see guys why you wanted me to comment on Emmy so much. Okay, so here we have one cup of dry rice, which yields about three cups of cooked rice. We got a whole can of beans and a few pieces of broccoli, which in total adds up to about a thousand calories and 200 grams of carbs for one meal, AKA 67% of your total carb recommendation for the day. I mean, this could easily have been split up into two or three meals. Ideally, I would have liked to see like twice as much broccoli, definitely less rice and beans, and a little fat in there to help carry those fat soluble vitamins. This lunch meal also lacks a lot of the satisfaction factor with really no seasoning and again, no fat. And even though we're seeing some more protein in the lunch compared to the breakfast recipes, I kind of feel like we went from zero to a hundred with an entire can of beans, which again, could have easily been split up between several portions to last a few days or a few meals. We're also getting about 88% of your total fiber needs in this one meal alone. And I have a feeling we're gonna blast totally past those recommendations as well. But let's take a look at what day three lunch is all about. You have to make sure that your meals have a good source of starch. So that's why to my salad, we are adding potatoes and beans to make sure that not only do we get the volume in there, but we get the satiety too. We have to make sure that our diet is centered around starch Okay, well that's an interesting salad dressing, but I will say that this salad is maybe the most balanced meal we've seen so far, even though it's still far from ideal. We're getting about 16 grams of protein, 16 grams of fiber, and it looks like a more adequate portion size. However, the lack of fat at this point is just kind of making me sad. It is totally your call if you prefer an oil-free salad dressing, like we've seen a lot of YouTubers, for example, make tahini dressings without any oil, which 
is still great in my books because the tahini can provide the body that we need. But this is not a dressing. This is like a fat-free hummus dip that looks kind of like baby food. I'm also just really concerned with the lack of any nuts or seeds or avocado or omega-3s, which is virtually non-existent in this diet thus far. But let's take a look at what is in store for dinners. Okay, so not only are we seeing a lot of oil-free recipes, but I'm also getting the sense that Emmy doesn't add any salt to her meals as we're seeing a real lack of flavor going on. I do not know what poor soul is actually gonna follow any of these recipes to a T. But anyways, as for the nutrition of this recipe, even though there's no complete source of protein, we are getting about 17 grams of trace amounts of protein from each ingredient like the squash, rice, spinach, and artichoke hearts. I actually think this would be a pretty tasty combination, but I would need a little more protein, maybe from some beans or tofu, or some fat from like tahini or nuts, and definitely some salt and pepper to make this edible. We are also seeing a ton of fiber for one meal, about 80% of your total daily needs in this meal alone. So it's gonna be interesting to see how this whole day pans out. Let's take a look at day two. Two pounds of potatoes, which is about 700 calories, and then about 77 calories for the broccoli. So that comes out to 777 calories. I don't really know where to start here. Uh, I'm not even sure how you do a beauty hero shot of a plate like that. I personally would have a hard time with that, creatively speaking. Um, but anyways, this meal is pretty consistent with what we've seen from Emmy's recipes so far. No fat, no seasoning, very carb heavy. It's a substantially larger portion than what would be considered normal for one meal. This meal is also, again, very high in fiber at 30 grams, which is enough to meet an individual's fiber needs for an entire day. But one thing I do want to highlight about this meal is the protein content. So far, we've seen that Emmy's recipes are either very low in protein or the protein content comes from large quantities of beans, oats, or nutritional yeast. In this case, despite not having a traditional or complete protein source, this recipe actually provides 30 grams of protein, which is considered an appropriate amount of protein for one meal. And while broccoli and potatoes naturally contain some amount of protein, you would need to eat very large quantities of these foods in order to meet your protein needs. Most people would have a really hard time with that, myself included. So to give you an example of how I would change this up, you could easily reduce the amount of potatoes down to about a cup, add about three quarters to a cup of tofu that's maybe cooked in a little bit of olive oil, or at least topped with some sesame seeds, cashew nuts, or a little peanut or tahini dressing. And we want to keep the veg in there, but one or two cups of broccoli would be great. That would have about half the calories as Emmy's, but would deliver so much more on the satiety and satisfaction factor, plus we would get a more balanced nutrient profile. Just a suggestion. Let's finish off with day three. All right, so same, same, but different, right? And I gotta say, the music in those hero shots is really, really hilarious. But anyways, lots of complex carbs from the brown rice, sweet potato, and corn on the cob, some veggies in there, way too much fiber from one meal, and not much else. Let's break things down. Overall, there are definitely some common themes in Emmy's meals with the high amounts of fiber, low amounts of fat, 
inconsistent amounts of protein and portion sizes, and of course, large volumes of starch-based carbs. Looking at our nutrient analysis, the amount of fat in Emmy's recipes makes up about five to 8% of the total calories, which is far below the 20 to 35% recommended macronutrient range for fat. We also know that this diet is very high carb and provides 70 to 82% of total calories from carbohydrates, which is well above the recommended 45 to 65% range. The overall protein range was low to moderate, but not overly concerning, as we did see some protein from a few different sources. But to meet those needs, you would often have to consume unrealistic portion sizes that are highly unlikely for most people to attain. I don't know about you, but I cannot eat three cups of unseasoned rice or two cups of unflavored oats. Also, given the fact that this is a high carb diet, it's no surprise that the fiber content of these recipes is above the recommended 25 to 30 grams per day recommendation, and instead provides up to 65 grams of fiber per day. Now, while I'm all about meeting our fiber targets, as many people do not even meet these targets, eating a large amount of fiber, especially for those who are new to plant-based, can cause severe bloating, pain, gas, diarrhea, constipation, and even reduce the absorption of some nutrients. So, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is get to know your toilet. Now, in terms of calories, they're pretty much all over the map. And although Emmy does encourage eating until you feel satisfied and not limiting portion sizes or counting calories, the total calories from these recipes are either way below or surpass the recommended range for somebody like Emmy. So it's ranging from 1200 calories to 2400 calories, which would be pretty confusing for a lot of people. Also, just based on what we've seen from Emmy's oil-free vegan recipes, they're all pretty restrictive in fat, seasoning, and sometimes also protein and calories. So I would worry that you're either going to feel super unsatiated physically, and this level of restriction may trigger a bit of a binge, or you may be so freaking bored with this diet and lack of variety that you have no appetite at all, so you just don't meet your nutrient needs at all. And I mean, is misery really the best way to lose weight? I think not. Anyway, I also want to talk a little bit about the health impacts of a really high carb, low fat diet. Although there is definitely strong research to support a predominantly plant-based diet, I do caution towards consuming a very high carb, low fat diet, as evidence on this is a bit controversial. Most studies have found that neither very low carb or very high carb diets are optimal, and both can contribute to increased mortality rate. However, studies have found a bit of a sweet spot of about 50 to 55% of total calories from carbohydrates being associated with lower risk of mortality. On the other hand, a high carbohydrate diet of more than 70% has been associated with increased mortality. And if you can recall, Emmy's meal plans provide about 70 to 82% of calories from carbohydrates. There's also been conflicting research showing that high carb diets have been associated with both the development and prevention of type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease, which is likely explained by the differences in glycemic index of the diet. This is why it's really important to mention that not all carbs are created equal. I will say that the carbohydrates that Emmy chooses are typically higher quality and lower glycemic index. But with such little variety, little flavor, and well, I don't know, joy, I would worry that it's gonna be damn hard for a lot of people to maintain this without slipping into some kind of high fat, high sugar, high calorie binge. There are also a lot of risks associated with a really low fat diet because it could increase the risk of infertility as well as nutrient deficiencies because fat is necessary in the diet in order to absorb fat soluble vitamins like vitamins D, E, K, and A. In addition, studies have shown that low fat diets can put one at risk for the development of depression, which may be partially due to a restriction in omega-3 fats, which we know is linked with brain health. I will definitely be speaking more about some of these concerns in a moment. But first, my usual questions. 
in general, is this way of eating balanced? Now, before I answer this question, I want to take a look at what Emmy actually has to say about the overall nutrition and health claims of this diet. Let's go ahead and look and we see here that we have indeed reached all of our targets and even surpassed them. I mean, look at fiber, that is just bananas. And every single vitamin that we needed, we got in mineral as well. The only thing is B12, which should be supplemented on this diet, either through pills or shots or drops. Um, but other than that, I mean, let's look at all of our vitamins. We hit everything except for vitamin E. The story behind this is that we need vitamin E to protect ourselves against a high fat diet, but we are not eating a high fat diet, so we don't have to hit that RDA. So that is absolutely fine. And then if we look down at our minerals, we have hit everything except for sodium. The sodium actually was not as high as it says in chronometer um, because we did not add any salt. We didn't get canned beans with salt. Um, so it was actually quite lower, but you could add liquid aminos, you could add iodized salt or uh, pink Himalayan salt if you are worried about your sodium levels. And the, the one that you might be wondering about is how did we hit it is selenium because you, usually selenium is quite hard to hit on a low fat diet. Um, however, the brown rice and the oats really helped us out there by getting a lot of selenium. So that is a great thing to note as well. And then my favorite of all is protein. We got nearly 80 grams of protein on this day and knocked it out of the park. I mean, we're over 200% on every single one of these proteins. So we will not be protein deficient or deficient in the bank either. Okay, so first of all, I am glad that Emmy mentions supplementing with vitamin B12, as this is very important for somebody following a vegan diet, high carb, low carb, whatever. But it looks like Emmy is playing into the pervasive myth that more is always better. Now, while certain nutrients like iron are tightly regulated by the body, meaning that the body will adjust the rate of absorption when it's getting too much from food, an excessive amount of some other nutrients, however, can potentially have negative health implications. For example, we are seeing really high phosphorus intakes ranging anywhere between 4,500 to 7,800 milligrams. And some studies have found an association between high dietary phosphorus with increased disease risks with intakes of more than 1,000 milligrams a day. Emmy's recipes are providing up to seven times that amount. An excess of phosphorus can of course cause things like diarrhea, as well as hardening of the organs and soft tissues. And higher amounts of phosphorus can also affect your body's ability to use other minerals like iron, calcium, magnesium, and zinc. I also really need to speak to the bold vitamin E claims here. So while studies have shown that the antioxidant properties of vitamin E supplementation can have anti-inflammatory effects for those on a high fat diet, that is not the only reason why you need vitamin E. The antioxidant powers of vitamin E also help repair damaged cells as a result of normal environmental exposure to things like air pollution, UV light, and cigarette smoke. It also plays a really important role in brain function, red blood cell formation, muscle repair, immunity, and eye health. So to say that you don't need it because you're not eating a lot of fat is totally absurd. It's also fat soluble, meaning that you need fat in the diet to be able to absorb this nutrient. So while the numbers may show she is just moderately deficient in vitamin E, when you also factor in that she's also deficient in fat, I would be concerned that the actual amount that her body is getting is even lower. So with all of this in consideration, do I think that this way of eating is balanced? No, definitely not. A vegan diet can be balanced 100%, but it does not need to be done with these massive portions of starch just to meet basic nutrient requirements. This high carb vegan diet that we're seeing from Emmy takes things up a notch by also restricting fat and really narrowing down the available food options to really only a handful of foods. So of course, you're gonna end up having to eat a lot more on this diet to feel physically satiated, and you're at high risk of binging or overeating due to emotional dissatisfaction. And bottom line, 
a mountain of unseasoned broccoli and potatoes just makes this dietitian really sad. Now, are there any problematic claims or assumptions made by this channel? Get comfortable, folks, because there is a lot to unpack here. So let's see what she has to say about the diet. I don't believe in counting calories. I don't believe in restricting your portions. And so I eat unlimited amounts of these foods. Do I stuff myself to the brim and eat like it's Thanksgiving every single day? No, because I eat to feel energized. I don't take the fact that I can eat as much as I want as a free card to gorge myself on all of these foods. I use these foods as fuel to fuel my body to feel incredible. Okay, so if Emmy feels like she thrives eating this way, then all the power to her. However, I do want to flag that even though her food philosophy is all about eating in abundance and not restricting calories or portion sizes, restriction is not just about quantity, but also about quality and variety. This is the difference between the experience of anorexia and orthorexia, for example. The fact that we're cutting out meat, dairy, vegan meat substitute, any processed foods, sugar, fat, and salt really narrows things down to a handful of safe foods. And that level of restriction can be really triggering for a lot of people. Now let's get into the nitty gritty of some of her claims. So let's talk about the question, where do I get my protein? Well, all foods have protein. And so long as you are eating enough calories, you're getting an adequate amount of protein. So I really hate the assumption that getting enough protein in a diet is strictly calorie dependent because it still is very possible to eat enough calories or even surpass your daily caloric needs and still not get the protein that we need. And we've seen this from other YouTubers that I've reviewed on the channel. But yes, some fruits and vegetables may have trace amounts of protein, sometimes like 1% protein or less. But the likelihood that people are able to consistently meet their protein needs without any sufficient sources is highly unlikely. For vegans specifically, studies have shown that vegan diets do tend to be lower in protein when they're not executed appropriately. In addition to also potentially being low in other nutrients like calcium, zinc, vitamin B12, vitamin D, and iron. Again, this is when they're not well planned. But this is often because vegan diets are high in fiber, which is a good thing but it can also make you feel really full. So it may actually be more difficult sometimes to eat enough calories to meet those protein needs if you're just relying on things like broccoli and potatoes for protein. I also don't like the mixed messaging where she insists that you get enough calories in order to meet your nutrient needs while simultaneously discouraging calorie counting. Folks, we cannot eat this unbalanced intuitively and not worry about meeting our needs. Let's take a look at what she has to say about fat. Where are the healthy fats? Because there seems to be an obsession with healthy fats. But just like I said about protein, so long as you are getting an adequate amount of calories, you're getting an adequate amount of fat because all foods have fat. Sweet potatoes have fat. Oats have a really good amount of fat, 15 to 20% fat. Brown rice has a lot of fat. All of these foods have fat in them. And as long as you're getting enough calories, you're gonna get enough fat. And developing a fat deficiency is very, very difficult. If we look at even the Okinawans, the Okinawans ate a very low fat diet, about five to 7% fat. And they were part of the blue zones, the areas of the world where individuals lived to be 100 years old. And they were thriving on a diet of sweet potatoes. So to seek out foods that are higher in fat, like nuts, seeds, and avocado, and supplement them for the purpose of getting healthy fats, do it if you want to, but it's not absolutely necessary. And I even reached out to Dr. Anthony Lim and I asked him, is it necessary for women to consume nuts, seeds, and avocado for hormonal reasons? He said there was no evidence to prove this and he referenced the Okinawan women who were wonderfully healthy and wonderfully fertile. Now I will say that some individuals do find that they have to include the 
these overtly fatty foods like nut seeds and avocados in order to keep a period because they're not getting enough calories if they don't consume those foods. There's also some talk about needing healthy fats for brain functioning, but fats actually don't cross the brain barrier, so that's not the case. Okay, so lots of things to clear up here. Um, out of all the foods that she mentioned having fat, oats have the most fat, but you would need to consume six and a half cups of oats to hit the recommended 20% of your calories from fat. Everything else is very low in fat. And just like what we said about protein, the idea that fat is calorie dependent is wildly misleading. As we saw from the nutrient analysis I did, regardless of the amount of calories that Emmy's recipes provide, the overall fat content was still less than 10% probably because she didn't eat seven cups of oats. I mean, who could? But to say that it's not necessary to eat anything like avocado or nuts or seeds for fat on a vegan diet and to only rely on calories is honestly really irresponsible coming from a nutrition professional. Now, in this rant, Emmy also references the Okinawa diet, which is the unique diet that's being credited to lengthening the lifespans of citizens of Okinawa. Japan. Now, the traditional Okinawa diet, though not an exclusive vegan diet, is pretty low in calories and fat and is very high in carbohydrates, largely as a result of the available foods that was in the region. Now, the longevity of the Okinawan people is largely attributed to the high antioxidant content and anti-inflammatory properties of the vegetables in this diet, not the fact that it is low in fat especially because we see other regions of Japan who eat a lot of fatty fish and who are also seeing reductions in chronic disease. As for the comment about getting a period, yes, eating enough calories is absolutely the most important dietary piece to healthy ovulation and menstruation. But fat may still play an important role. One study actually did find that getting adequate DHA, which is a type of omega-3, was also associated with a lower risk of anovulation. As for the discussion on dietary fats and brain health, the positive effects of omega-3s on brain health is well documented in the literature. Studies have shown that the EPA and DHA in omega-3 fatty acids are vital for the maintenance of normal brain function and are abundant in the cell membranes of the brain. In fact, some studies have shown that lower levels of DHA in the blood have been associated with smaller brain size, which is a sign of accelerated brain aging. Furthermore, research has shown that omega-3 fats may help protect against neurodegeneration and the development of cognitive impairment, can help prevent and treat anxiety and depression, and can even improve mental disorders like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. On the flip side, not getting enough omega-3s is linked with learning impairment. So with that in consideration, it sounds to me that dietary fats, like omega-3s, do a pretty good job at crossing the blood-brain barrier. In fact, omega-3s have not only been shown to cross the blood-brain barrier, but some studies suggest that it may actually help preserve its integrity. Next. Now let's take a look at what she has to say about calcium. The, the harsh reality is that when we consume animal protein, so something like milk has animal protein in it, our bones have to release something alkaline because of the acidity of the dairy. So something acidic comes into our bloodstream and our bones have to release something to balance out the pH. And unfortunately, our bones release calcium. So if you look at you know correlations around the world, and I'm not saying this is causation, but the correlation, it's like, come on, between dairy consumption and bone fractures and osteoporosis in different countries, the more dairy that is consumed, the more osteoporosis and bone fractures there are in the country. So my calcium levels, according to my blood tests, were perfect as well. So we're good to go doing what we're doing. Okay, so first of all, I would love to know what this something that Emmy is referring to that's apparently released from our bones when we drink dairy. Um, but anyways, regardless of what that something is, I will just say right off the top that there is nothing that you can eat that will alter your blood pH. 
the pH of our blood is actually very tightly regulated. So whether you eat something acidic or alkaline, our blood pH will not be effective. So this is not something that really any of us have to be that concerned with, assuming that we're healthy. Now, as for the evidence on dairy milk and bones, there is so much to unpack here. I'm just gonna actually leave some links below to some blog posts that I did about this specifically. But the correlational research that she's referring to suggesting that there were higher hip fractures in developing Asian countries with higher milk intakes was actually debunked by the fact that physical activity was not considered. And when physical activity was put into the equation, the discrepancy actually disappeared. As for the pH claim, when examining a number of randomized control studies on the effects of types of protein, animal and plant-based, increased intakes of protein not only didn't increase adversities in bone calcium, but rather protein was shown to be actually beneficial to bone mineral density. As for the concern of acidic phosphates in milk causing calcium excretions in urine, other randomized control studies have shown no changes in urine calcium balance. Now, ultimately, I say you can get calcium and vitamin D from lots of sources, not just milk, not just dairy, and I don't care how you get it. I am not a milk pusher. I mean, I don't even drink glasses of cow's milk myself. But, but to claim that dairy explicitly is leaching calcium from your bones is just not well supported by the research. Next. Those, those pastries, cakes, and cookies, it's not the sugar in there that's causing weight gain, it's the fat in there. And of course, it is essential that you have excess calories in order to gain fat. So if you're eating less calories than you're burning, you could eat a bunch of Twinkies and you're not gonna gain weight. But if you're eating more calories than you're burning, then it's the fat that's being stored as fat. So all the sugar in that stuff is not being converted into fat. It's the fat that's being converted into fat because those products are so high in calories. Okay, wow. Um, well, let's just make one thing clear. Carbohydrates have calories. Fat also has calories. Protein has calories. Oh, and so do all basically foods other than, I guess, water. Um, so if you were to theoretically have zero fat in your diet and you were to overeat lollipops or fat-free muffins, you will store those carbohydrates as fat. Now, this brings me to my main beef with Emmy, which is her co-opting of the term food freedom. Emmy's idea of food freedom is that because a high carb, low fat diet is naturally lower in calories, you can therefore eat more food, and she even says you can pile your plate high. This whole volume eating strategy is a common diet tactic to really fill yourself up on high water, high fiber foods with very little substance so that you don't gain weight. When you're heavily restricting foods you enjoy, there is often a psychological need to eat a lot of volume as you kind of are searching for a little bit more satisfaction. But if we were just to add a little protein and maybe some fat with our meals, we could boost that satiety factor without the need for massive portions. And when we add a little bit of salt in there, or I don't know, heaven forbid, sugar for flavor, we add even more satisfaction. When these two things are not aligned, it's a pretty good indicator of an unsustainable, unhealthy diet. Ultimately, this is a diet packaged up with a pretty new shiny bow and repackaged as a healthy lifestyle. In fact, all of the diet messages I'm seeing in this program are completely at odds with the concept of food freedom or intuitive eating. It is not enough to say, hey, eat as much as you want, when you can only eat a handful of different foods, all of which are basically coming from one single food category starch. Restriction, whether through quantity or types of food, is inherently at odds with intuitive eating and food freedom. Unfortunately, I am just scratching the surface on the misinformation on this channel, but I am pregnant, I am tired, and now I am pretty hungry for some like peanut butter. So I just need to put this all to bed. Bottom line, I have always said that the best diet is the one that you can sustain over time, all your life. And while this diet may seem to work for Emmy, 
I am very concerned about the risk for physical health in the form of severe nutritional deficiencies and emotional health in the form of disordered eating and orthorexia. And on that note, I think that is really all we need to say about it, right? I mean, this one was a doozy. So if you liked this video, definitely please be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below on who you'd like to see me review next. Subscribe to the channel and I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.